we go. Uh, Emily, I take it you can see that, please? Good. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to sit down for this presentation, so that's why you see me a little bit lower on the screen uh, than before. So, uh, in discussing uh, medications, just as when I discuss psychosocial treatment for ADHD children, uh, I'd like to uh, explain both to families uh, and to uh, other interested adults, uh, why are we using medication with ADHD children? Obviously, uh, we do so because it has a very large evidence base for its risk benefit ratio, for its effectiveness. Uh, so that evidence base involves now hundreds, if not thousands of controlled trials comparing the various medications to placebos over various intervals of time up to uh, and including about two years in terms of controlled randomized trials uh, and uh, beyond that in terms of following people up in longitudinal studies who have been on medications for years. So uh, the evidence base is quite substantial. Indeed, probably more evidence for the effectiveness of ADHD medications than for any of the other psychiatric medications uh, that are available that is proving their effectiveness. Uh, of course, what this evidence base has shown is that the medications are uh, incredibly safe besides being effective. And indeed, I argue that they are the safest medications prescribed in psychiatry, uh, just because of the, not only the amount of evidence we have, but the evidence showing that most of the side effects, although annoying, uh, and annoying enough in some people to have to be dealt with through various forms of adjustment to the dosing, the type of medication, the delivery system, the timing, uh, but not in terms of being life-threatening uh, or leading to long-term uh, physical or emotional harm to the individual who takes them. So all of the issues that have been raised previously, as we will discuss in this presentation, with regard to long-term safety uh, have been uh, addressed quite nicely now in very large population studies of people taking the medication, as well as longitudinal research like mine that has gone on for 20, and in the case of New York, the 30-year follow-up studies. We're seeing high rates of improvement in individuals with medication. Uh, 70 to 90% of clinical cases show a positive response to one or more of the medications on the market. 50 to 60% of those cases are brought to within the typical normal range of behavior uh, with regard to ADHD. Uh, so uh, there is no other psychiatric medication that can match those statistics. That's not to say that everybody responds, they don't. Right? Uh, and we're going to talk about that in this presentation. But the rate of responding is greater than we see for anxiety drugs, antidepressants, certainly with uh, the antipsychotics as well. So. Uh, and the degree of normalization is markedly greater than we see, as well as the degree of improvement. So it's not just the number of cases or the percentage of treated people that respond, but the degree of change is three times greater, at least, than we see with other psychiatric drugs. Uh, so the amount of improvement is quite impressive. Uh, medications compared to psychological and other treatments are very convenient to administer. Uh, they're also often cheaper than the other forms of intervention. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that while medications have side effects, as I mentioned in my last presentation, so do psychosocial treatments as well. Uh, the expense of medication, of course, cost effectiveness is, has been shown repeatedly uh, to be quite good in terms of its profile. Uh, and then medications can be used for years, uh, even into adulthood and across the lifespan, uh, where necessary in reducing harm and reducing impairment and managing the individual's uh, symptoms. So uh, we have a very good window of influence here from young childhood down to age two, uh, all the way up into the elderly years of using these medications with some caveats, of course. Uh, depending upon other characteristics of the patient we're going to talk about that uh, need to be weighed in terms of medicating, 
and choosing the right medication for the right person, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and then of course, medications can be used and remain active across a diversity of community settings where psychosocial treatments simply can't be implemented for uh, children or teenagers. When a teenager is driving home uh, on a Friday night late in the evening, having been to a party or a dance or something, uh, the medication can be present in the bloodstream, whereas a parent may not be there during these unsupervised times in the community when the child is waiting at the bus stop or out in the community or uh, in the case of teens among peers or at the mall or engaged in other unsupervised activities. Medication can be there in the bloodstream. So uh, medications produce a far more pervasive effect across community settings. And then now, as I will go into in a little bit more detail in this program, we have more than 33 published studies showing that the longer you stay on ADHD medication, the more likely the brain is to grow and normalize in the areas of the brain where ADHD arises. Uh, and that has been called neuroprotection. Uh, the term I think is a misnomer. Uh, it was borrowed from the literature on the neuroprotection that antidepressants seem to provide for dementia, uh, but it really should be neuro enhancement because unlike neuroprotection, there is evidence here of neural growth in underdeveloped brain regions from remaining on medication. We'll go back into that later. It seems to occur in about 25 to 40 percent or more of patients who stay on medication for several years or longer. Uh, it remains a somewhat arguable effect among neuroimagers, but as I said, there are 33 studies now that have found people staying on medication show more brain growth than those who don't. Um, we don't know uh, the characteristics of the people likely to improve. Uh, again, I'll come back to these points a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, as you see here, at least in the United States, uh, we have three different classes of medication that are approved by our Food and Drug Administration for explicit use with ADHD children and adults. Uh, of course, the stimulants have been around the longest, amphetamine since the 1930s, methylphenidate since the 1950s. Uh, and of course, we're talking here about the various methylphenidate products uh, that I'll mention when we get into these, uh, the different delivery systems that are available now for them, uh, as well as for amphetamine. And then of course, here in the US, starting in 2003, we had approval for the non-stimulant, which is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which is atomoxetine. Uh, and there are other drugs in the pipeline that are also uh, probably going to be coming up for approval soon that are norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors as well. And then most recently, starting around 2009 in the United States, were the old antihypertensive drugs used to treat high blood pressure, uh, often called alpha-2 agonists, uh, these being guanfacine and clonidine that were reformulated into extended release delivery systems for use with people with ADHD, uh, and those have now been approved for use as well. So those are the approved types of medication that we have available, and there are many different names and delivery systems for the drugs in the marketplace within these three compounds or these three types of medication. Of course, there are also other medicines used in the US off-label uh, I'll show you some of them, but I, of course, uh, am not recommending them to you at this point because they don't have uh, our FDA approval. But clinicians uh, are well within their rights to use those medications off-label if they feel they are uh, appropriate. If you're not familiar with how these medications work, uh, quite simply, I'll, I'll be very brief here because some people find the neurochemistry of this rather boring. Uh, but in the case of the uh, stimulant medications, uh, let me describe the diagram here. Here you're looking at uh, nerve cells that are projecting their uh, boutons, if you will, but their terminal endpoints uh, into a synapse, which is a cleft or a gap between nerve cells. So here's the presynaptic nerve cell. 
And here's the postsynaptic nerve cells they're projecting onto. This is the gap here. Uh, and what we see is that as a signal moves down this nerve cell to its terminals, uh, there are packets of neurotransmitters in the terminal for dopamine and norepinephrine. You see over here, this is a norepinephrine nerve cell. This is a dopamine nerve cell. And as the electrical signal moves into the terminal, these packets move to the membrane. They erupt and express the neurotransmitter into the synapse. That neurotransmitter crosses the synapse and binds to the next nerve cell on its postsynaptic membrane. And if there's enough neurotransmitter that binds to that nerve cell, it will trigger an electrical signal in the postsynaptic nerve. So that's how the nervous system is working. It's a neurochemical electrical system. Uh, and in this case, we're interested in the norepinephrine and the dopamine nerve cells. So how are the stimulants working? Uh, methylphenidate primarily works by blocking this little pump known as a reuptake transporter. There are on dopamine nerve cells all over, by the way, not just here, and they're on norepinephrine nerve cells. And their job is once the chemical has been expressed uh, into the synapse is to vacuum that back up into the nerve cell after it's done its job. Uh, so there are these transporters, these pumps or vacuum cleaners, if you will, uh, all over the endpoint, and they're going to pull the transmitter back in and repackage it. Uh, in the case of methylphenidate, it's blocking mainly the dopamine reuptake inhibitor, but it may also work on the norepinephrine reuptake pump as well. Amphetamine is known to work on both of them, not just uh, the uh, dopamine one. And atomoxetine, which is the norepinephrine drug, works primarily and exclusively only on the norepinephrine. Though. But what all the ADHD drugs are doing is preventing reuptake. The end result, there's more of the neurotransmitter left in the synapse to bind to the receptors and fire the nerve cells. Um, so very interesting. That's why all of the ADHD medicines, well, the stimulants and the NE reuptake inhibitors uh, are working by blocking reuptake. Okay, now when we get to the alpha-2 drugs, they are working on the alpha-2 receptor. So here's our nerve cell right here. Okay, there's one, this is a glutamate nerve cell. This is a norepinephrine nerve cell. These mainly are up in the cortex or the frontal lobes, uh, but they're elsewhere as well. Uh, and on this receptor nerve cell, besides these little reuptake receptors, or these receptors rather, um, we have these alpha-2 ports right here and here. Now, what happens is when a signal comes into this nerve cell, right, and crosses over and triggers a reaction in this nerve cell, these portals are going to open and close like sphincters, and they are going to determine how strong that signal is moving along that nerve cell. If they're open, the signal is uh, degraded, and it won't be as strong moving through the nerve cell. It's going to be more noisy, and it may not even fire the nerve cell all the way up to its own termination. Right? Now, what are the alpha-2 receptors, clonidine and guanfacine, doing? They are closing the portals. What does that do? It creates a stronger signal in the nerve cell that is less degraded by other, if you will, noisy nerve cells around this particular nerve cell. So it's working in a very different mechanism than the stimulants or even than the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which is working here on the norepinephrine pumps. So although all of these drugs reduce ADHD symptoms, they do it through different mechanisms on the nerve cells, 
and they do it through different regions of the brain as well. And this is just a diagram showing the closed portal and the stronger signal. So that's how the drugs are working in 